This podcast contains graphic subject matter and is meant for mature listeners only. Previously on Bardstown. Sheriff Department says they still do not have enough evidence to make an arrest in the case, but the sheriff has eight pages of, quote, circumstances leading him to believe Brooks Houck is responsible for Roger's disappearance and for what may have happened to her. He said they're not going to find my daughter. They're not even going to try. Of course, he's, you know, he's, I felt the same way. I'm Shay McAllister. This is Bardstown. When Crystal Rogers vanished in July 2015, Tommy Ballard never stopped looking for his daughter. Finding Crystal was his passion, his mission. For 15 months, that's what he did. I never dreamed in a hundred years something like this would ever happen to us. It makes you have a different perspective on life, that's for sure. He lived and breathed it. That's all he did. Crystal was Tommy's pride and joy. Sherry Ballard has photo after photo of Tommy with Crystal spanning 35 years. You know, he's like, I want a little girl, and he had her name picked out. He named her. I didn't name her at all. He was the best husband. He was the best daddy. And I used to tell him, if something happened to you, I'd just die right with you. You know, I couldn't. He's like, no, you would go on, you know, you would find somebody else. I'm like, no, you don't understand. You just don't understand. Tommy might have been getting closer to the truth of what happened to his daughter, Crystal. I can tell you my husband would have never stopped until he found those answers. But we'll never know for sure, because Tommy Ballard is no longer able to join the search. He's no longer alive. It was just before Thanksgiving, November 19th, 2016. 54-year-old Tommy Ballard gets ready to leave his home, the home he built and shared with his wife Sherry of 40 years. Wearing jeans and his dark blue Prayers for Crystal hoodie, he fills his front pocket with Little Debbie snacks for him and his 10-year-old grandson, Trenton, who's heading out with him. So he got up early that morning, and my son and his little boy was going to... My son and my husband were very, very, very close. Tommy left here. He got Trenton up, and he he went to the pantry, and he was taking snacks with him. And I remember telling him, you better take some for Brennan, too. You know, make sure you have enough for him. It's 6.30 a.m., and Tommy tells Sherry goodbye. They say, I love you to each other. He hops into his red 4x4 pickup truck the one always seen in fields while he relentlessly searches for Crystal, the tailgate branded with a large missing poster for his daughter. Trenton, Crystal's 10-year-old son, climbs into the truck and they head to a secluded part of the family's nearby farm for some early morning deer hunting and bonding. At 6.40, Sherry lays back down. I remember going back to my bedroom and on the way to the bed... You know, I I just said, God, look over them in the woods today. And I said it out loud, you know, I I guess I was talking to God out loud, but, and I laid back down. Tommy and his grandson pull onto the private property, which butts up against the Bluegrass Parkway. And they wait for Tommy's son, Casey, and his other grandson to join them. The crisp morning dew still covers the grass as they step out of Tommy's truck. At 6.50, Trenton stands next to his papa when a blast rings out, crashing into the early morning calm. A single shot rips into Tommy's chest. That single gunshot is heard across the fields, splitting through the morning air. Casey's wife hears the gunshot from their home. My son heard the gunshot. My daughter-in-law heard it in their house because they lived close by. And I remember Casey saying, dang, Daddy already got a deer. Um, I mean, they had just got out of the truck. Tommy reaches for Trenton and tells him he's been shot and to start looking through his clothes for his phone. Tommy is trying to speak, but he can't breathe. At 6.55, Sherry has fallen back to sleep when her phone rings. It's Trenton. 
He's in tears. I got the phone call. Trenton called me, and I couldn't hardly understand him. And he was so upset, and he's like, he's like, Mama, Papa's been shot. Um, I was panicking, you know. I was trying to throw my clothes on and get ready, and I went in the bathroom. I told Trenton, I said, I'm going to call 911. I said, I will call Casey. And, you know, I'm scared because Trenton's there and I don't know what's going on. She hangs up and frantically dials 911 while getting dressed and running to her car. Racing to the farm with her emergency flashers feverishly blinking, she runs every red light she comes to. She makes it there in about three minutes. Casey's already on the scene with Tommy. Police officers and the EMT are there too. And I just drive down the hill and I remember thinking, why isn't the ambulance going down the hill? They're just sitting there. Why are they sitting there? And I jumped out of my car and I ran over to him and Casey and Trenton and Brennan sitting there. She pulls her car up behind the ambulance and police cruiser and rushes to her husband's side. And I remember the ambulance and a sheriff was in front of me. And they didn't have any lights on or anything. And I remember thinking to myself, why don't they have their lights on? And I could see Tommy laying there. She pushes past the paramedics to get to her husband. She drops to Tommy's side. His eyes are wide open. She can't see any blood or bullet holes. She begs him to get up. And I ran over and knelt down to Tommy. And I shook him. And I just begged him to get up. He was just laying there and... And then the ambulance come down there. She shakes his limp body, lifts him up and shakes him. I mean, there was no blood, no nothing. So I kept shaking him. And the last time I shook him... And he had blood come out of his nose. And that's when they pulled me off of him. I know he was gone when I got there. But it didn't hit me. I didn't realize that. It's still hard for me to realize that today. In the middle of that nightmarish scene, Sherry turns to 10-year-old Trenton for information. Anything to help her understand what's happened. I said, Trenton, did you hear anything? Did you see anything? And he said, Mama, I didn't. He said, we didn't. I don't think Peppa heard anything. And he said, um, but he looked through his scope and he was just looking. And I feel like that Tommy saw the glimmer off of the gun that shot him and it caught his eye and he was trying to look through his scope to see if something was there and that's when he got shot but Trenton just told me he said Pebble tried he said he tried to talk to me Mama, but I couldn't understand him he couldn't get it out Angie Bischoff, the leader of Team Crystal, remembers when she found out that their search leader and close friend was killed. I was walking into work, and my ex-stepdaughter called me, and she said, you need to call and check on Tommy. I said, why? And she said, uh, he was in a hunting accident. So I tried calling Sherry. Of course, I didn't know all this at the time. She didn't answer. So then I called PJ, Sherry's daughter-in-law, and she finally answered me, and I said is he alive or something along those lines? And she said, no, he didn't make it. And I don't remember the drive from there. It was awful. It was awful. It's still awful. He was like our dad, but like our best friend. And to think, I drove past it that morning when he was out there in the field. That was awful. Since that brisk fall morning, Sherry has returned to the spot where her husband and the love of her life died. 
Sherry says the farm is impossible for anyone to know about without thoroughly scouting the area first. The property is angled, and the direction the single blast came from would be a difficult shot for the most experienced shooter, in her opinion. They knew it was no accident when they got there. I remember the first person I called was a detective that he doesn't like his name mentioned, but I trusted him 100%. He was not from Bargetown. I told them, please call him, get him here. And he did come. He came immediately when we called him. I did not trust Bargetown. And I, I don't think Bargetown had the equipment or the tools needed for a case like this. And I never once on any interview said this was a hunting accident. Everyone knew how upset I was about that. I talked to law enforcement one time, I won't mention who, and I asked them, why are y'all saying this is a hunting accident? And they told me that if someone came back later and said, well, I accidentally shot him, I didn't name two, then we could get sued. Well, you know what, at the time, I didn't care. I didn't, I didn't care if they got sued. This is my husband, and this is a murder, and you know it. And you're saying it's a hunting accident? No, I'm not okay with that. Coming home to an empty house, it was too much to bear, especially when leaves start to fall just outside her kitchen window. It evokes a cherished memory with Tommy. When I first came back to home, I couldn't even look out my kitchen window. Everything reminded me of him. I question, should I stay here? I can't look at anything here. And then I thought, no, he's here everywhere. How can I move? Me and him would sit at the kitchen window, and we have a tree right there, and all the leaves on it, when they start to fall in the fall, they just all start falling at the same time. And we would sit and watch that tree. And when I looked out that kitchen and seen that tree, I just wanted to chop it down. Um, I would look down at the barn, and I'm like, he would be pulling up down there, you know. He would, that's his barn. He would be down there mowing grass. It was so hard for me because I always mowed, and then he would pull up the driveway and come and weed eat. And when you're on that mower, you have nothing but thoughts running through your head. Just stupid little stuff like that that people wouldn't even think about. But I look at this house, and I'm like, he built it. He built it for me and the kids. And he's everywhere in it. I have so many memories here. Today, inside the Ballard home... A rustic barnwood sign with Crystal and Tommy's photos and a butterfly hangs on the wall with the words, Until we meet again. I still can't believe he's gone. It's so hard. He was just my world. Kentucky State Police Trooper Scotty Sharp was a detective when Tommy was shot. He arrived on the scene just before 8 a.m. We came out and... uh on Tommy Ballard, of course, uh, uh, he was shot on the uh, edge of the Bluegrass Parkway. So we have worked since that day diligently working all three cases and working in cooperation with the Nelson County Sheriff's Office and the disappearance of Crystal Rogers as well. Is there any connection between Crystal and Tommy's cases? Well, you know, right now, that, that's still part of the investigation. You're going to hear that a lot from me today, unfortunately, but that's just the way it is. Um, you know, right now, we have nothing that, uh, no evidence that connects them two together, but obviously there's speculation in the community. Sitting inside the Elizabethtown Post, surrounded by lush cornfields, he says Tommy's death is being investigated as a homicide. There's always been some confusion because we title cases as death investigation. That has always been the, just the kind of way we do things around here till we get our, gain a suspect in there. But that doesn't diminish the way we investigate any of our cases. We treat Tommy Ballard's case as a murder, and that's the way we investigate it. And we follow leads. 
and I think there's been concern in the public because all getting hung up on that term, death investigation versus murder. But that I, 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 I've stressed to everyone, that doesn't diminish the way we work the case. Early on, KSP urged anyone who may have been traveling on the Bluegrass Parkway between 6.30 and 7.30 a.m. that morning, near mile markers 21 to 25, to come forward. We're making a plea for uh, trucking companies that come through that maybe have active dash cam that uh, didn't realize that they may have gotten something on dash cam that, that may uh, help us in our investigation. But Sherry thinks some leads may have fallen through the cracks that could have solved Tommy's death. I don't understand certain things, like there was a tip that was brought in, a huge, huge major tip that could have been exactly what we needed. KSP did not respond to that right off because the guy did not give their name. I don't understand that. What difference did it make? I mean, what about an anonymous tip? What do they do in that in that circumstance? They've never given me an explanation that's you know, made me feel better. When they got there, the evidence was gone. It had already been moved. But it was crucial evidence. It could have been huge. It could have solved this case, in my opinion. Tommy's case. It's hard for Till Ballard to talk about his son, even three years later. (laughs) Tommy was my son and a real good friend to me. But uh, Tommy was an honest man. And uh, I really miss him. And uh, I do anything in my power to find out who killed Tommy, you know. But there's only things, certain things you can do, you know. It's, uh, I just hope and pray that the day comes that Tommy will get justice. And we'll get peace, you know. I had a lady up to Buzik's Lumber that owns Buzik's Lumber Yard told me this week how much she thought of Tommy. <laughs> and as we've said before, Bardstown is a small town. In this small town, though, you're in the same industry mm-hmm. as someone who you think might have had something to do with all of this. Right. Right. I think the same people that murdered Crystal has something to do with Tommy's death. And I'm not the only one that thinks that because I've had, I've had business people come up to me and I won't mention their names and tell me who they think murdered Tommy. And I put, I won't call no names, but I put a state trooper on the spot and I asked him, I called two names the one that killed Tommy, and the getaway driver. And he said, well, we're talking about, we're thanking the first person you named, but we don't know about the second one. I hope I live long enough to see him burn in hell. That's the words I said, and that's what I mean. But it, it's hard to think that, you know, they're the ones that murdered your grand, my granddaughter. And, uh, you know, and like I say, there's nothing you do about it. Angie Bischoff, the leader of Team Crystal, recalls when a detective gave her some advice at Tommy's funeral. Lay low and watch your back, because you don't know. So I got my concealed for that reason. (laughs) So that stays with me. What's been the change in Sherry since he died? She's broken. We try to lift her up. I try to be the one that makes her laugh, because when we get together, we cry. Because I do Sherry's hair, and she'll say, I'm sorry, I'm crying. I'm like, nope, sorry. Let's get tissues out because we'll both start crying. You know, she's still very determined, and she's not scared. And that's another thing that we both, we all learned is you go in with no fear. If you have any fear, stay out because you're a liability. But she's sad. It's, she's sad. But she's, she misses Tommy so bad. And she, naturally, she misses her daughter and wants closure on both, but. That's one of the words I guess I can really give it. She's broken. So we try to keep her lifted up. I met Tommy during the many searches for Crystal. As we drive around Bardstown for interviews, I tell Jessica about the kind of man he was. I knew Tommy. I worked with Tommy. I went on searches with Tommy. 
looking for his daughter, Crystal. And it's pretty rare in journalism to be there with someone before they're a victim. I knew him as a person. I knew the kind of snacks he took on searches. I knew you know, the way he looked at his wife. It's just personal. It's different. We kn I knew him. And he's not just a victim. He was a father of a victim that I had a relationship with that I would call and text to see if there was any updates in her case. And so it just is different because I think that we, living in the area, living through some of these cases, watching them and following them for years after others have moved on or stop, it's just close to our hearts. And I think that no matter how they find answers, if they find answers, whether or not we are part of it, it would be huge just because I care deeply for these people. Forrest Berkshire, editor of the Kentucky Standard, talks to Sherry often. She's been very open with us. You know, she's communicated a lot. It has not deterred her. She has said that, you know, she feels as if Tommy was killed to silence him because he was seen as the leader of this, as the force behind the search for his daughter. And she feels as if he was killed to hurt that, to set that back. And she has said that she is not going to allow that to happen, that she will take it on if, if she has to, and she will lead it. And she has done that ever since you know he was shot and killed. But for someone who's from rural Kentucky, the idea that this was an accidental shooting is absurd. From what I understand, it was kind of center mass. You know, around here during deer season, you, know, you don't really go out in the woods, you know, for fear of getting shot, but that's not a hunting accident. The chances of that being a hunting accident would be less than being struck by lightning. With no arrests and little information made public by investigators, residents have developed a lot of theories over the years. Self-described citizen journalist and blogger Richard Caldwell is one of those people. You've lived in the area, at least this vicinity, most of your life. How rare is it to have an accidental shooting when it comes to hunting? Um, hunting is in the blood of a lot of the people in the area, but I mean, so is drinking. This is a bourbon capital of the world, and owning a gun and using it regularly doesn't necessarily mean, you know, they can pull off trick shots like that. These funny angles, you know, over an overpass or through trees, or just, it's suspicious. I mean, there's a lot of hunters in the area, but I don't think most of them would be able to, just from my personal experience. And I can't think of too many who would have reason to, you know, actually shoot someone to death. Do you think there's a connection between whoever shot Jason Ellis and who shot Tommy Ballard? I don't know if it was the same person, but I mean, Jason Ellis, if he was a true blue good cop, then he would have been a threat to, you know, whatever nefarious wing of, of the, the local police department. And I think Tommy had become enough of a very vocal critic of the, the, the ineffectualness of the police that, you know, he would have been a threat to that, that same shadowy wing. It might not have been the same person pulling the trigger, but it could have been the same local power player who called, called for it done. Why was Tommy, do you think, a threat to whoever? Because he wouldn't give up. But Tommy and Sherry, they weren't going to shut up about that, and that might have rubbed some people the wrong way. Nelson County Sheriff Ray Penaroa calls it mind-boggling to have so many unsolved cases in his county. It's never happened here. Somebody knows something. Whether they're scared, whether they're part of it, it's where you want to be. If you want to be driving the bus, telling your story, or being a witness, or part of being charged. They got to pick what seat they're riding in that bus. Sherry isn't shy about saying what she believes happened to her daughter and her husband. Someone wanted my husband out of the way. They knew he was never going to give up searching for my daughter. And I think they just wanted him out of the way. Do you think Tommy was close to finding something? Do you think he knew something? I don't think Tommy knew anything, but I know there was one certain place Tommy wanted to search all the time, and I don't know. He put that out there on Facebook, and he told Team Crystal, get ready, we're going out of town. And he also 
Not my granddaughter put a post on Facebook that he was going to run for sheriff. So Tommy was doing things. He wanted change. He wanted answers. Do you think someone thought he was going to find them? They were trying to stop us from finding my daughter. And they were trying to stop us from this going any further into investigations. But after spending the day with Sherry Ballard and her family, Jessica and I discuss the next family we'd like to sit down with. So someone who is a name that keeps coming up in almost every single interview we've done so far, and actually even not interviews, like people we just talked to in town, is Brooks Houck. And obviously that's Crystal's boyfriend, the last person to have seen her before she disappeared. There's a lot of accusations out there, both by the community, by the family, but also by law enforcement. He's been named the suspect. He's never been charged with anything in connection with Crystal's disappearance. But I think to tell his side of things is important to this story and to see what he has to say or if we can find his brother, Nick, who is the Bardstown police officer who was fired. It seems like that is what we need to go after, is trying to talk to them. Does the Houck family know anything? Are they hiding anything? We want to hear their story and what they believe happened to Crystal. So, Jessica and I go on the hunt for the Houks. Next time on Bardstown... Hey, are you Anna? Hi, my name's Jessica. Is Nick home by chance? Could I see him? Leave my gun, take my home.